Chase. Okay, so I first of all need to make the comment David said about sex or the toilet seat. Uh, is there a difference? <laughs> um, moving swiftly on, uh, I didn't choose this title. Hopefully the intelligent ones amongst you will have spotted the, spotted the deliberate mistake. C. diff is a gram-positive organism. Um, so that's the first thing to say. And also, not only did I not choose the title, but I didn't choose the subject matter. I did agree to it, so you could criticise me for agreeing to it. But because it's um, virtually an impossible subject to deliver in, in the space of 20 minutes, I, I'm going to have to be um, extremely selective in what I try and talk about. And I am going to spend <coughs> approximately half that time, a bit less actually because I'm waffling at the moment, half that time on non-C. diff gram-positive organisms, the other half of the time on C. diff itself. So, so that's what I'm going to try and do. And, and also, I'm, I'm only going to be concentrating on drugs that are here and now, uh, newer ones, in line with the, with the title, but I'm not going to talk about developmental pipeline drugs. There just isn't the time um, in, in, um, within that slot. And um, this is for my great friends who work in compliance. I love you all dearly. Um, and um, so I thought I'd put it up. But in particular, the, the last two or three lines may be of some relevance to some of the things that I'm going to say with respect to either um, anti-staphylococcal drugs um, or um, one particular C. diff drug. Um, so, first of all, the, the, the um, uh, MRSA story with respect to newer agents. If you look, at this, this graph gets trotted out very frequently um, uh, around the world, but, but it shows data from a smattering of European countries. Remember, there are 28, depending on how you count them, countries in Europe, um, and the, so this is just about half, less than half of them. Uh, and these are data which talk about, as the title says, empirical usage, it was surveillance data, looking at what actually was used empirically to treat um, uh, MRSA infection, presumed MRSA infection, often rather than known MRSA infection. And um, this um, is chaos. Um, uh, effectively in terms of the, the very choice of agents that are used um, in these different countries. And uh, I'm not going to actually talk about that, but I just wanted us to, to have that background of chaos, and therefore anything that we can do to improve on chaos, real life, um, would be a step in the right direction. Um, so I also wanted to put in to frame the, um, the IDSA, uh, the, the most recent IDSA guidelines on, on ABSI um, treatment and the, and the drugs they talk about there. Um, these latest guidelines, as the reference at the bottom shows, um, is, uh, is 2014, so they're already quite old now. But remember, when, when they were produced, not only did they not say anything about tycoplane because they don't understand tycoplane, but they didn't say anything about the two long-acting um, lipoglycopeptides, Dalba and Ritavancin, um, because they weren't available at the time. And Tadizolid also had not um, been launched at that stage. So those four don't appear um, in those guidelines. And the other one that I'm going to mention briefly about today, Keftabiprol, also um, um, had just started its um, hokey cokey, one foot in, one foot out, approval, not approval, um, and so on, um, story of which, which is still going on to this day. So, so that one doesn't appear in these guidelines as well. I haven't got a slide here, but I could show you a slide with many, many more antibiotics on it, which are the antibiotics which are discussed in, this, um, in the IDSA guidelines for um, SSSA. Um, ABSI, but because I wanted to try and keep it a little bit focused on, on MRSA. David uh, wondered whether I was going to mention about enterococci and treatment. I'm not. I haven't got time. So um, what I've done is I've stolen a table out of a review that um, 
uh, several of my friends and colleagues, including Dilip Nathwani, Matt, Matt Dryden, recently wrote in the first author, um, is, is David, um, uh, as shown there. I'm just going to briefly, um, because th what this does quite nicely, this table, is it, it compares and contrasts according to the categories on the left-hand side, which I'm going to reveal, um, these five newer um, MRSA antibiotics. Um, and um, I'll put my glasses on because I can't read this. Uh, that's better. Um, so, um, and I'm not necessarily going to repeat everything that's shown up here because, because one of the qualifications for attending this meeting is that you can read. So, um, but, but what I want to do is just highlight some of the things that are in this table and some of the things that are not in this table. So the, the spectrum and so on is largely dull, um, so I'm not going to talk about that. We all know about the classification. Um, when the, the, the first stark differences that, that appear, though, are when we start talking about the PK and the dosage, dose activity of these different drugs. Um, so let, let's just, just concentrate on tadesilid, first of all. Um, highly orally bioavailable. Um, like um, linezolid, but with a, a longer half-life. Um, uh, it has extremely good tissue penetration. Now, the dosage, and this is important when you consider potential advantages vis-a-vis -vis linezolid, the dosage of tadesilid is one-sixth of the dosage, the daily dosage of linezolid. So instead of 1,200 milligrams a day, this dosage is 200 milligrams a day, one-sixth. And therefore, not surprisingly, if you're giving one-sixth um, of the amount of oxazolidinone, it's, it's, you're likely to get less toxicity appearing. And that's what the data suggests so far, certainly from the phase two and phase three data and the animal data, but also the, the real-life data suggest lower, genuinely lower toxicity associated with tadesilid compared with linezolid. Um, if we look now at the, uh, the two lipoglycopeptides, aritavantin and dalavantin, extremely hard to, to put a pin in between these two in terms of um, whether you want to use a drug once and once only or whether you want to use a drug twice, potentially give, give a repeat dose after seven days. And just to complicate matters, <coughs> studies are, um, have been performed with dalavantin, which is the twice uh, the, the two doses in total to show that actually one dose is probably sufficient. Um, so um, for me, these, these do potentially revolutionise how we treat patients, but as ever, our practice needs to catch up with the potential that these drugs offer rather than the other way around. And, and so and it's quite hard that where these drugs have been available for two or three years now, they often have not made huge inroads into practice because our practice is very slow to change because we're used to treating people <coughs> once or twice a day and seeing them once or twice a day or two or three times and not giving them one shot and waving goodbye. So that, that's a challenge for us. Keftaroline, keftabiprol. Um, very similar, break the mold in terms of MRSA, cephalosporin activity because they because of the binding to um, PBP two prime. Um, uh, once or twice daily dosage and once or three times daily dosage. But again, just to confuse, there have been then follow up studies with keftaroline where the dosage has been increased to three times a day to try and overcome largely European clones of MRSA that had um, a peri MIC breakpoint um, uh, level of, of resistance. And so you had to go up to three times a day to try and bring those into the spectrum of, of susceptibility. Um, the, the, where um, the, the approvals um, gradually is changing, of course, for these. Keftabiprol, interestingly, the Hokikoki drug, as I've referred to it already, has now got FDA approval, and that's as of a year ago now, whereas it is going to ha uh, be carrying out studies not only in ABSI but also in bloodstream infection, staphylococcal bloodstream infection. So it will be very interesting to see um, the data that come out of those studies. Um, 
I, I'm not going to, the weaknesses here, not surprisingly, are labelled as cost, although that's acquisition cost. And some of the pharmacoeconomic data that are available for some of these options, um, for example, to Desolate suggest that savings or at least offsetting the high acquisition cost may be possible. So the original phase three data of Tedesilid of course showed that a six day course of Tedesilid was as active, as efficacious rather, as a 10 day course of Linezolid. Some might say, do we really need 10 days of Linezolid or is that over, over egging things? But again, I go back to the fact that this is a much more active drug to desolid, needing requiring one sixth of the dose, daily dose um, of, of linezolid. And it's actually even less than that if you look at the whole duration when you take into account six days versus 10 days. Um, in terms of strengths, uh, a lot of them are, are listed here, um, uh, but, but some, some are, are not mentioned as well. Um, uh, there is actually increasing. Uh, real-world experience with Tadesilid showing, ironically, using longer duration therapy, longer than six days, for extremely severe staphylococcal infection, deep-seated, often involving foreign bodies, and, and may uh, possibly presenting with or without sepsis. Um, and, and ironically there, that, that lower, that enhanced activity requiring a lower dosage um, is now starting to, is, is one way of using this drug and looking at this drug's advantage compared with linezolid. But it would appear from early data that the drug is also efficacious in these very severe infections where longer therapy is, is, is reasonably uh, indicated. And you're not going to treat those sorts of infections I've just alluded to with only six days of therapy. Uh, Keftaroline, Keftabipril, I just want to, to mention about their relative uh, gram-negative activity, even though this is a talk about gram-positive uh, activity in gram-positive drugs. Um, Keftabipril has the better um, uh, gram-negative activity compared with um, uh, Keftaroline, uh, but is that enough for this to become a workhorse gram-pos, gram-neg drug? rather like, uh, with, that just happens to have MRSA activity, like <coughs> kefuroxine used to be and then kefataxine was. Um, I, I'm not so sure, sure it is. So really these drugs in the context of ABSI should be seen as, as having utility where there is a, a significant chance of gram-negative infection. For example, surgical site infection um, is, is an obvious place. Um, there are extension studies being carried out for the lipoglycopeptides, uh, potentially in osteomyelitis, which can, could be extremely useful if you get, a, get away with treating these patients with two or three or possibly four doses in total, and that would give you four to six weeks worth of coverage. So that really, again, would transform how we treat treat these infections if our practice can catch up with the drug's attributes. Now, in the interest of time, I'm going to move on. Um, and I just wanted to say briefly before I move on to CDIF to, uh, about this um, data reanalysis that, that Dilip Nathwani and colleagues um, published in CID last year. And what this was doing was attempting to look at this moving of the goalposts that the FDA had done, where instead of looking for um, treatment efficacy at the end of treatment, uh, which is still to this day the European way of assessing efficacy in APSI, um, of course, um, FDA requires um, measurements of efficacy after 72 hours of therapy. So the question that Dilip and colleagues looked at was how predictive, how, how accurate was the assessment that's made at 72 hours in terms of predicting what actually happens after the end of therapy. And um, I actually find predictive value data, the, the, these two right-hand columns, much more easy to understand and get my head round than the sensitivity and specificity data. But if you don't, then ignore what I'm going to say next and just gaze at these numbers over here. But, but for me, look at the predicted, the positive predictive value of this assessment at 72 hours. And what you see is very high PPVs. 
So in other words, if a patient is improving at 72 hours, there is a 95 plus percent chance that they will turn into a clinical cure at the end of treatment. Conversely, and this is the major learning point here, the negative predictive value of that 72 hour assessment is woeful. <coughs> so if you see somebody who is not responding at 72 hours and is therefore an FDA failure, that has very poor predictive value for ultimately whether that patient responds or not. And that says to me that either the assessment criteria are wrong at that 72 hour point or the 72 hour point is wrong and it requires more work. And it will take a brave person to convince the FDA of that fact perhaps, but I think these are quite intriguing data, particularly in the, obviously in the context of APSI. So um, I've got probably less than 10 minutes left, um, uh, so I'm going to have to whiz through this. Um, that's a volcano, and on the top left is a volcano lesion. That's the terminology used by histopathologists to describe the eruption of the lava, in this case the stuff that forms the pseudomembranous plaque. What causes the, on the top left, well it's toxins, it's not what causes the thing on the, on the bottom right. But the point about C. diff infection is that with Bezlatoximab, which is what we're going to talk about for the next five minutes, um, we actually have the, the first true antitoxin therapy um, available. Now because and there's too much data on this slide to go through in, um, in, in detail. But because um, this is an antitoxin rather than an antibacterial drug, it needs to be given alongside antibacterial therapy. So you, you, you choose, the, the idea is you choose your favourite C. diff drug. And in the study that I'm going to briefly show you the data from, um, the, the MODIFY studies, that was either primarily metronidazole or uh, vancomycin, a spattering were treated with fidaxomycin. So they get the standard course of therapy and at any point in the 10 days after starting that therapy, they, um, they have a single infusion of bezlatoximab. Actoximab, antitoxin A, as opposed to bezlatoximab, which is antitoxin B, um, was not effective. That's really the end of the story. It did nothing on its own it did nothing additional when combined with bezlatoximab, and so, which was a bit of a surprise. Everyone perhaps assumed that the marketed product would be two monoclonal antibodies, but actually it's one, just the antitoxin B. Um, and uh, so you can see the efficacy data. The primary endpoint here was not clinical cure. It was CDI recurrence which is one part of the sustained clinical cure story. So I'm just showing the primary endpoint data here, and you can see uh, there were two studies. Only one of them had an actoximab arm, which was dropped um, by prearrangement because it was ineffective. So you can see the red bar in terms of the recurrence rates, the same as the placebo bar. All these patients are getting standard of care. But you see the large reduction, about a 40% reduction in recurrence risk that was achieved by bezlatoximab uh, as compared with placebo. Uh, and interestingly, and I think the real strength of this phase three program was that there were um, five predefined subgroups of patients, um, of patient types that were destined to do worse according to folklore uh, around C. diff and uh, infection outcomes. That is, the elderly, those who'd had C. diff in the past, those who were immunosuppressed, those had severe CDI, uh, and those who had a hypervirulent strain, the example here being OT7. And these predefined subgroups, you can see that bezlatoximab um, was, and just concentrate on the right-hand side data here, um, Bezotoximab was more effective than placebo in all of those subgroups, with the, significantly more so, with the exception of the hypervirulent strain patients, where whether there were insufficient of those to power it, um, or it genuinely wasn't more effective, but you can see the confidence intervals just span 
and <coughs> at zero here in terms of risk. Now, given that this is a, a drug with a 19-day with a, a half-life, four or five lots of 19 days, to give you the terminal um, distribution of the drug, terminal excretion of the drug, um, would give you a protection period of about three months. And you can see here that over the, th over the 12 week period that patients were, all the patients were monitored for, you see no diminution of uh, effect, of treatment effect in terms of reduction of recurrence risk. So that, that absolute reduction of 9, 10%, which is a relative 40% reduction in risk, was maintained throughout that 12 week period. There was actually a su subgroup of patients studied for up to a year, and there were no breakthrough infections in those patients. If we look at just two or three quickly interesting subgroups, those with renal impairment, we still see a positive uh, treatment effect by bezlatoximab. Similarly, uh, a very small group of, of about 20 odd patients um, with, um, irritant, with inflammatory bowel disease and C. diff infection. These patients are virtually always excluded from C. diff studies. They weren't excluded from the modify studies. And, and uh, in terms of the magnitude of a treatment effect was maintained, it's too much, it, obviously we don't know whether that's a significant effect or not because the, the size was too small, um, but it is intriguing that the drug may be effective in those patients. So very briefly, this is the map of what happens in terms of patients going from uncolonized to colonized status under antibiotic exposure, we already knew before bezlatoximab came along that if you, if you had a host response that meant you generated antitoxin antibodies, you were significantly less likely to get infection and or to get a recurrence. What bezlatoximab appears to be doing is augmenting those patients who cannot produce an antitoxin antibody response once they've had their primary C. diff infection and that's how it is reducing the risk of recurrence, be it relapse or reinfection. Lastly, because um, I haven't got time, maybe we cover this over, infection, it, it, over questions. Um, there's, a, there's a conundrum now with two drugs that are more effective than the conventional drugs, metro and vancomycin, namely fidaxomycin and bezlatoximab. And I've indicated how we tend to use um, fidaxomycin on the left, and I've suggested how bezlatoximab might be used on the right, and I've highlighted some particular patient characteristics that, that according to the phase three data, <coughs> may make bezlatoximab more applicable than fidaxomycin. Um, and I'm just going to put that lot up as the summary of what I've said. Sorry I've spoken over time. Thank you for listening.